We noted uh, last time that the direct hydrocarbon indicator or an amplitude anomaly was often used as, a, as an interpretation technique, a basis for locating prospects uh, for, for drilling. Uh, we we noted that there was a significant pitfall with that. We'll re review that in a, in a minute. But we go from this kind of a normal offset uh, stack trace, uh, normal incident stack trace representation, over to we'll be looking at how amplitudes vary as a function of offset in the common midpoint uh, gather. And a good general paper. Uh, hydrocarbon detection with AVO amplitude variation with offset. Uh, some people, you know, refer to it as amplitude variation with angle. Uh, you can you can find this paper at this uh, this link down here. But note in this case we have a gas sand and we're looking at the reflection from the top. We come from a shale with a higher velocity and do a gas sand with a lower velocity, and we can see that as offset increases, the reflection from the top of the gas sand becomes increasingly increasingly negative. And of course the reflection from the base becomes increasingly positive because the velocity in the gas sand has been reduced um, by the uh, um, presence of uh, you know a, a relatively small amount as we saw of gas saturation within the sand. So to say it's a gas sand it could could only have a few percent, uh, three, four, five percent. Gas saturation would produce a sig significant decrease in the uh, amplitude of the reflection from the top. So this is the negative amplitude uh, of the reflection from the top, and the positive uh, reflection would be from the base, not shown in this diagram. And just, just to kind of recap from last time, we have um, the amplitude anomaly that and again, a major pitfall with this approach was that uh, we're using the uh, Gertzma velocity here. It's a function of the different compressibilities of the uh, the matrix of the fluid, and uh, we've got bulk density here, which is calculated, which is based on varies with water saturation, and uh, we have uh, also the um, <coughs> shear modulus, uh, which is also a, a varies with compressibilities. And we saw that with a small increase in gas saturation, it could be on the order of less, uh, less than 5% actually, we get a significant uh, decrease in the reflection or increase in the negative uh, value of the reflection coefficient from the top of the gas sand. So this becomes a much larger, in an absolute value sense, uh, which is probably one of the reasons that Domenico presents his plot the way he does. Um, so we can see that we come from a re reflection coefficient of almost zero down to, to one which is minus uh, 0 0.27 or so. And uh, the reflection coefficient, again, is just the difference of the impedances over the uh, sum of the impedances. So this would be the major pitfall, is that we could get this kind of an anomaly with a very small uh, percent gas saturation. And uh, so you might spend a lot of money drilling into a feature like this and find that you had relatively small gas fraction. Now this is an example of, here we have uh, various uh, stack views. We've got a far offset stack. So we're just stacking the uh, traces that we see, the far offsets. Here we have near offsets, so we're excluding the far offsets in this case and just looking at the near offsets. And here we have a full stack. This is what you're normally looking at when you're looking at your seismic display. Now notice here that the far offset stack, that we see a, a flat spot. <clears throat> and this is indicative of a fluid, fluid contact, which is cutting across the reservoir. So this could be a gas water interface here. We don't see it in the near offset stack. There's very little evidence, uh, much less evidence for it in the uh, full stack. It's, it's become largely obscured. So you can see how amplitude variations with offset and how the full range of stack can obscure features that you might be interested in. Um, <clears throat> 
Amplitude variations with offset, they're usually classified in classes 1, 2, 3, and 4. And uh, one of the takeaways from this diagram here and from the stacks that we just looked at is that if you look at the normal incidence um, seismogram, for example, which is often used to tie a well to the stack trace, you can see here where we have a high positive amplitude. But as we sum together all the traces in the stack, we go from positive amplitude on the near offsets to negative amplitudes on the far offset. They all get summed together so that the reflection amplitude is likely going to be somewhere in, in maybe in this region here on average. Also for this class 2 set of reflection events, we might really not see a reflection from a reservoir uh, at the zero offset might have very small amplitude, it might be buried in the noise, but you can see that with increasing offset becomes uh, the, the negative reflection takes on a higher and higher negative uh, value as we go to longer offsets. And if we stack all this together, we're going to see a significant response from uh, the reflection from, the, let's say, the top of a gas hand. And likewise here, we might predict a reflection coefficient of a certain a reflection amplitude of a certain value just looking at the uh, normal incidence a zero offset response however we get increasingly negative contributions to the stack so the negative amplitude here would be much uh, much larger than we might anticipate and uh, amplitude and phase vary with offset so there's some or stack amplitude after NMO correction is often going to be very quite is going to be quite different from what you see or might predict based on the uh, uh, zero uh, zero offset uh, zero offset response. So now this is a probably we think of this. See, we have a reflection from the top of a gas hand here, which is negative. So we're down in this range, and it gets increasingly negative. So this is probably a class 3 uh, amplitude uh, AVO anomaly. We can see that the P wave velocity decreases in the gas sand. The shear wave velocity increases. This is probably due both to the increased uh, shear rigidity and uh, decreased uh, density with the presence of uh, gas. And, and we can see the decrease in density over here. <clears throat> so uh, perhaps a class two or three anomaly. And um, but we can see that when we stack this, that the amplitude that we'll see in the stack trace will probably is going to be an average of all these amplitudes. So it's going to be somewhere in the middle. You might predict an amplitude like this, get an amplitude like this. You say, well, that's no big deal. But kind of the key here is that we can see this. Uh, increase in amplitude with offset, so it provides additional information that we aren't aware of. And we often attribute um, mist ties to Fresnel zone features, but we also have a very significant contribution to um, mist ties uh, between your normal incident synthetic and what you see in the uh, full stack seismic section can be due to these uh, amplitude uh, variations with offset influencing the amplitude of the stack trace. So I just wanted to come back to this um, you know, formula, formulation of amplitude variation that we, with offset that we talked about before, this two-term Shuey approximation. Uh, this reflection coefficient term here has the um, Gertzma velocities and uh, uh, Domenico's um, densities, which are varying as a function of water saturation. So over here, the the amplitude variations with offset that we plotted up over here are for a water saturation of 95%. So we're looking at amplitude variations with offset for that very small gas fraction producing large uh, uh, variations in amplitude with, uh, with uh, large drop in the reflection coefficient for small increase in the gas uh, saturation. So just using this, this relationship here.
So this would be this would be probably a class two response. This would be a class three response. And uh, this is just another visualization of the different classes of amplitude anomalies, and it uh, comes from um, the uh, uh, CGG um, site and Hampson and Russell. As, and I didn't include a link here, but uh, it should be easy to find. Class two impedance difference is minimal. Uh, so we're kind of looking over here. We don't really see much of a reflection, but the it starts with low amplitude, but then the negative amplitude in this case increases with offset. And class three, we have a significant uh, impedance contrast, but it increases uh, with offset. So, uh, and then these are the variations. We're looking at variations from the top. And these diagrams over here also include variations from the base. So we see a decrease across the top for the class two. And we would also see an increase across the uh, base as we go from low velocity to uh, <clears throat> higher velocity in the shale. Likewise, for, well, for all of these. And um, so, so again, until we get into this AVO, until the advent of AVO analysis, and um, we we had these uh, issues with um, you know looking for amplitude anomalies and using amplitude anomalies as evidence for uh, gas saturation, high gas saturation. So another thing to point out is that um, we're you know we're going to be looking at um, Ostrander's paper and kind of comparing what we get with his results and. Uh, he assumes a much smaller Poisson's ratio for the sandstones than Domenico does. And we just note that Domenico's objective was to incorporate uh, depth varying Poisson's ratios. So he had uh, Poisson's ratios of 0 0.39, 0 0.24, and 0.24 at these various depths. And we see how this influences the uh, drop in reflection coefficient, the increasingly negative reflection coefficients at different depths, 2,000. 6,000 and 10,000 for oil and gas. And over here, just, just to illustrate the influence of a reduction in Poisson's ratio on the Gertzma velocity, I've just incorporated a 50% reduction of Poisson's ratio into the, into the Gertzma velocity term. And so this would be for the original uh, Poisson's ratios used by Domenico, and then this would be uh, those values reduced by 50%. And you can see well, usually a reduction in Poisson's ratio is associated with uh, an increase, increasingly um, a rigid um, um, interval, a higher velocity interval, and we can see that the velocities over here with the original sigmas vary from uh, 4,000 to 10,000, over here about 5,000 to 11,000 feet per second. And the reflection coefficients, uh, consequently, are reduced. Over here, we have a range from minus 0.27 to 0. Uh, over here, minus 0 0.17 to 0 0.05. So the values of the Poisson's ratio that you use in the um, uh, Gertzma velocity certainly going to affect the results that you, that you model. So next time around, we're going to consider the three-term Shuey approximation. And uh, we did pretty well with the uh, two-term approximation. We, we can see these uh, class three anomalies are, are predicted, class two and class three AVO anomalies are predicted using the uh, two-term Shuey approach. And um, this may be a fairly rough, it's, a, it's an approximation, and all these linearizations are approximations of the Zopritz equations. So we're going to take a look at the three-term approximation that we see here. And I would just note that in the uh, two-term approximation is also often rewritten in this form, and where we have the uh, normal incidence reflection coefficient, which is an intercept, considered an intercept, and then we have the gradient, which is this term over here. So the two-term Shuey approximation has been used as the basis for this uh, intercept gradient cross plot. We're going to take, we're going to add in this uh, third term, and uh, we'll kind of compare the two and three-term approximations to those um, uh, 
presented in uh, Ostrander 1984. So thanks for joining us and see you next time.